2 Corinthians 5, 13 through 17 says, For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new, crea a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. One of my favorite questions to ask people when I meet them and are wanting to get to know them, maybe go out for lunch with a new couple, is how did you meet? It's always an exciting question to hear how people have met. and They often glance toward each other. And if you ask this question, they glance toward each other as their story often excites their, their voice, their expressions rise. And because I'm a pastor, sometimes their cheeks redden. But overall... If they remotely still like each other, it's an exciting entry point for them to invite me into their lives and into their stories. I get a great sense of the challenges that they faced beforehand, kind of who they were, the strengths, maybe the challenges they've gone through early on or even together. It always seems to mingle into all these strengths and challenges and maybe hopes they have. And, and I start to know their whole story because I start with their love story. It's a fantastic way to get to know new couples and new people. And I thought about this as we were talking about the love of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And I was like, do we really know God's love story? It started long, long before God hung the sun, the sun and the moon in the sky, even before time itself. God is love, John says in John, 1 John chapter 4. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. It says, basically, I'm going to give you a synopsis of it, right? I'm not going to go through every verse. Forever and perfect community, harmony, and mission. God did not create out of a sense of loneliness. He did not create out of a sense of boredom. He created out of that community. His love, he wanted to expand. They created the world to share in that communion that they've always had. Their love story goes back forever. And they've loved and they've been united. And they've had the same mission forever. So they didn't have a meeting point. But they have always had love. And the whole point of creation is love. But not just any love. A love defined by their relationships. You have to keep that in mind as we go this morning. Because if we're going to glorify what? Not just love itself, but we're going to glorify the love of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We have to figure out what that looks like to some extent. So though the word Trinity isn't in the Bible, I think we probably know that. Trinity is not in the Bible, but the name of all three of them is in the same passages in the New Testament 106 times. They are intimately linked together. It's beautifully recorded in some of the most amazing stories, right? You have Jesus' baptism as the Father calls him his beloved and the Holy Spirit descends. Uh, love is majestic on the mount of transfiguration. Listen to him, for he is my son, right? My beloved. More intimately, it's pictured in Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus subjects himself to the Father's will. Now, he doesn't do it because God and his Father is demanding that he do it. He does it because of his deep and abiding love and mission that he shares with the Father. And what does he say? Not my will, but thine. That's a love statement. That's not a command statement where he just says, you know what, you're in charge and I'm going to do what you say or I know things aren't going to go good. He, he submits to this deep love of the Father. See, love isn't just a feeling. It's not just an idea. It creates, it unites, it strives, and it finishes. The cross, we have to realize this, the cross, if we're going to know anything about the Trinity, even before time, we have to know that the cross is love's ultimate revelation. That's probably not a revelation to, many of us, to all of us, or many of us. But Paul says he is compelled. Did you see that word? Controlled. I like the word compelled there better from the Greek. I think our version said controlled. But love, Paul is compelled by what? The love of Christ 
And to do what? The the context is to share the good news of Jesus in a way that represents who Jesus is. Because they wanted, we talked about it last week, people wanted to glorify themselves, right? They wanted all this esteem. And he's like, I'm not doing it that way. I'm going to do love. I'm even going to do how I share the gospel in the same way Jesus lived. So he's, he's compelled by this love. So when the Father sent his Son into the world, he knew he sent him into a loveless world that's really just unbalanced by legality and a promiscuity of unbridled desires. It's just, a, it's a dark world. John tells us at the beginning, go read for John, the gospel, start there. He sends Jesus into this dark world. And when we celebrated Christmas, right, we celebrated the revelation of God's powerful love back into creation. It's not just, let me say it this way, love met mankind again. John says we couldn't comprehend it. It was so different than the way we think of love. It's so different than the way we think of power and all these things that we just couldn't comprehend it. It's it's on the cross here. Not just that we see God's love for us. In other words, when we look at the cross, a lot of times we say, wow, how much did God love us? That's a great question because that's true. But the love of the Father and the Son is just as important. We sang about it in just one of the songs. The, the breath of the Holy Spirit breathed out last. Jesus forsaken, the Father turning his head away in the song, and he dies. And we see God's love and the suffering of the Son, the Father's love and the suffering of the Son. We see Jesus' own love for us, of course, in the suffering. But we see that he's not just suffering for us, he's suffering because it's the will of the Father. He's suffering for the Holy Spirit. And certainly the grief of the father as the wrath is poured out on his son. Yes, so there is the aspect of when Jesus connects us to this love of the father. How does he do that? Because he says, you are forgiven, right? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. What does he also say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those two things go together. You don't get the the forgiveness without his forsakenness. It is such love that compels Paul. Does it compel us today? It's that power, it's that same power of love also, though, you have to remember, that resurrected Jesus from the dead. It's what resurrects him. He has shown us in death and resurrection, not only an intensity of his passion for community, but the immensity of love's power. In other words, we see that immensity of what he's willing to die for in the cross, but we also see the immensity of what love does in resurrection. It's in both places. But Paul states that when Christ died, all died. That's a strange statement. I mean, you read that and that's a a very strange statement. What does he mean? Here's it. The cross wasn't simply a moment in history. It is the moment of all history. It defines the entire thing. You're on this side or you're on that side. And that sides are not the point. You're in lo- you have God's love in you or you've decided to accept and only accept self-love and the way I want to be and care about myself. It enveloped all history in this one love event. There is a love event of history. We have creation, which we might talk about, but we don't see it in full, God's love, until the cross. We don't get why he created. He created so immensely, so carefully, because of his intense love. He knew that we were going to sin. He knew that each one of you were going to sin, and he created anyway, knowing that he was going to have to send his son to die for you. And that's dying for you. And... spreading, you know, shedding his blood and giving himself up and being forsaken, all of that pain. He knew at the history of, before the history of creation, before history itself, he was going to do that. But we see it revealed here in the cross. Here's the thing. God, we kind of miss this point a lot. God is love. He, that means he is also love's only source. He is love's sole source. If he is love, then there is nothing that we might call love that's really love unless it comes from him. Might have to go back on the video and hear that statement later. 
But you see this major difference in every interaction between the Father and the Son and the Spirit. As every encounter in the biblical text and in the New Testament, someone or one of the persons is putting out the effort to make the other one known. They're never bringing glory to themselves. The Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit. They're always acting on behalf of one of the other. That's how this community of love works. So how does love work? How do we know what love looks like? The Father works that we may know the Son and the Spirit. The Son works that we may know the Father and the Spirit. And the Spirit works that we may know the Father and the Son. All for the glory of God. In other words, the whole, the community, the oneness of God. It is irrational to the world to, have a, to crucify a Messiah. And Paul's here going, I know this doesn't make sense to you. If I'm out of my mind, he says, right? If I'm out of my mind, it is for God. I'm speaking God's language here. I'm in, I'm in God's love language, and that's not making sense to you. So I'm trying to, he's basically saying, so I'm trying to speak logically in ways that you can comprehend. And ways they're comprehending, they're like, man, this doesn't make sense. He doesn't look great. He doesn't act like he, God isn't picking him up and putting him up on a mountain. It's Paul. Why isn't he doing that? Well, because the cross is what defines Paul's life. Bringing glory to God, to make God known, is God's life, not to make Paul known. Do you see how he's reflecting that? He's reflecting, making, and bringing glory to God in a way that Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Father have always done for one another. That's the nature of love. God, you have to remember, it's, it's so deep, but it's also irrational that God gave his son for us. That God would send the second person of the Trinity for people who had forsaken him, had denied him, and hadn't loved him in a way that he had created them. Jesus died for you. The Spirit resurrects you from the dead, a new creature, he says, even now. It's the finding of real love that compels Paul to speak. A love so powerful that death cannot hold you. That transforms you into this new creature, this new creation, unshackled from the world's version of love. So we've talked a bit about love. And it's a very powerful thing. But really, is it true that all you need is love? The Beatles were right and horribly wrong. <laughs> The, uh, Paul says, love never fails. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, famous statement, often read at weddings. Most of, many of you probably had 1 Corinthians chapter 13 read at your weddings. And I remember at college, I was there and some friends of mine, two friends who were roommates, and it was a large group of friends. And uh, these, we went to this Bible study, a whole bunch of us, her parents were going, one of them's parents were going through a divorce. The other one, the other girl who was the roommate, had, had just, their boyfriend had just, who for a long time had just broken up with them, and they were really upset. And right after this scripture was read, and we had gone back, and we were sitting at a table, I think at Applebee's, I'm not real sure, we're sitting at a table with a group of friends, and one of them bursts out, what a lie! If love doesn't fail, why are my parents getting a divorce? The other one, why, why is my boyfriend breaking up with me? I love him. Love failed. Now, it's not usually a good idea to mix good contextual biblical interpretation with broken hearts, so I didn't. And at the moment, I probably said something comforting. The pain of broken relationships in so many of our lives the twist of what love should be. It causes a lot of doubt. It causes a lot of pain for people who say, and they go, God is love, so why did love fail for me? If all you need is love, what happened? Here's the thing. Christian has, Christianity is very specific in having an answer to talk about this. Sin turned love inside out, almost literally. We're going to talk about why. It's important to understand the world's concept of love 
and the difference between what Christianity offers. Most Christians, I don't think, quite grasp this concept well. Love defined today is a mere echo of God's love. It's almost like a shadow, it's an inversion. I mention it often, but people now define their life, their identity, their truth from the inside. It doesn't really matter what identity you have. It doesn't have to be one of the ones that people are arguing about right now. It doesn't have to be one of those. It could be any kind of identity that you have. It might be just things that you like to do. Things that are your pleasure. It might be something that's taboo. It might be something the culture finds acceptable. And they feel like, and we're taught now, that the more that you shine this desire and these hopes and these dreams, the more that you're going to feel whole. The more you're going to feel complete. So now, love is defined by me. It's defined by my desires. It's defined by what I pleasure, by what I want, how I want to feel, what I need, and what fulfills this identity of mine. And don't go taking your mind off to every other alternative identity. Again, I'm talking about your identity. Your specific ones. The ones that make you think, if I do these things, I will feel whole. Because honestly, most Christians aren't doing anything differently, but living from the inside out, and they're griping that other people are doing the same thing all over our country. They're not taking in full definition of what's going inside, inside their own hearts. Because we define our love by bonds of pleasure, a contract maybe, a building with people life, a commitment to remain. We take little aspects of God's real love and we apply them to our emotions and our world building of ourselves. So like God, we try to create a world out of love. Did you know, I see this all the time and it's very painful. I'm not saying this out of getting on to anyone. I'm saying it out of pain because what I see is people in doing this, they build such fragile lives. The smallest things break them. The, the anxiety just crushes them. They're trying to hold on to these little worlds that they're making, that they're trying to build from the inside out. And anything, anyone else's pleasures or thoughts, and it touches it, and it, it just crushes them. And it's heartbreaking because it does crush them. It does hurt. It does bring real and true pain into their lives. I think there are a lot of people who sincerely want a better world that don't ever, never walked into a church or a synagogue or a temple of any kind. They want people to have good lives. They want a better society. But they buy into a philosophy that the only way that can happen is to deny exterior authority and listen to their heart. And when you start to really think about it, if we all did that, then the I mean, well, they think this. If we all did that, they say that the world would be great. Do you know the movie Bruce Almighty? One of my, I didn't know what to think of it when I first watched the movie. Still don't in some ways. But it satirizes, it mocks, you might say, this kind of idea. And it's, it's basically God gives his power to Jim Carrey. That's, it's, that's, that's itself a comedy, right? But God, Jim Carrey gets his power and he wants to give everybody their wish. He wants to be this good God, so to speak, and letting everyone create their own worlds. Like if you could, everyone could have their own world, this is what the world would be like. So what does he do? He lets everybody win the lottery. And so they all had different numbers. And so everybody's like, this is irrational. This is breaking my brain, right? How could everyone win the lottery when, well, this doesn't make any sense. And then everyone only gets like a buck, right? And and it's like this, you're breaking the world because if you just gave everybody and the world was created just by everyone creating their own world, it gets pretty chaotic and it gets messed up and it gets destructive. It's made more, he, the whole point of it is Jim Carrey makes this gigantic mess by letting everyone create their own little worlds how they want and trying to be that God that does this for them. All you need is that love, so to speak, to destroy the world. That's what the point is, not fix it. You know, the word tolerance for love has been adequately defined lately by social scientists as social hedonism. And I, don't, I think it's about right when you start to think about how it's actually working out. Now, we aren't here to force Jesus on anybody. A church is not here to force Jesus to do things. Tolerance, though, has kind of changed its flavor um, in recent years, it essentially means that making room for everyone to create their own worlds. And so I think that Jesus and Christianity is based in that freedom to choose Jesus or not. And I, I agree that people should be able to do their best to create their own worlds if they're going to reject Jesus. 
because we're not here to create that world for them. God created and we're trusting him with it. But hedonism is the ancient Greek philosophy that the meaning of life is one that you can fill with, that you fill with pleasure. In other words, the more pleasure you are, you have, the, the more your life feels fulfilled. You kind of, the whole idea is you get as much, <clears throat> much attention and pleasure as you can. Now, since God has disappeared from our culture and even secular stoicism disappeared from the, our culture in the 1960s, which that means that stoicism was the embrace of logic and you suppressed desires, right? You remember some of the people maybe that were your grandpas or great grandpas, they suppressed their desires, they suppressed these things and they did their duty, they did all these things. And that actually has its own evils, if you will, if it's not done within Christianity. So, but that went away in the 1960s and it was this entire secular socialistic hedonism. Well, what's, what's that mean, you know? And I think people are logical enough to know that everyone can't have their desires met. That's the thing about Jim Carrey. It makes it funny for everybody. We all know that, that that can't happen. But social hedonism, it's on your outline if you grabbed one in the back. Social hedonism defines justice as the distribution of the greatest amount of pleasure for the most people. In other words, evil is defined by any denial of access to pleasure. Anything derived from an inner state. And that's how we're starting to see justice system start to decide stuff and all kinds of... Here's the thing. Honor, duty, rationality, patience, and the life of others is all in service of this hedonism and of this pleasure. You might find some virtues. You will find virtues and people all over the world. You'll find some sacrifices. But it must bring opportunity, glory, or, pr or pleasure. You'll see this at work, homes, stores, politics, places of worship. And since I'm talking about the church's mission, I'm not here to just to focus on what's going on in the secular world. I'm talking about how the secular world is affecting the church. I'll focus on the church and our temptations. There's several of them. I'm going to touch a couple. You'll see it in worship wars. Y'all remember what worship wars are? Worship wars when everyone was arguing and still go, some of it's going on about music, about the styles of music, right? It's got to be my style or this style, that style. They're all, this, they're all small instances where people see worship defined by how they're experiencing pleasure. How much pleasure am I getting from worship? How pleasurable did it make me feel? It's often deeply embedded inside your heart every time you walk into a worship service is, did God give me a feeling today? A great feeling, a guilty feeling, a feeling that I feel something. The, the very power of transformation of life is before us, and here we are hooked on a feeling. Truly, I, the references to all these love songs is not over, don't worry. <laughs> Truly, it is, it is like inheriting a gold mine when you're a Christian and you accept Jesus. And you go to worship, we get all our friends together, and we go on a deep dive for lead ore. Just to find lead. You have a gold mine, you're going to go looking for lead or some other cheap metal. What do you think is the best possible outcome with an encounter with God this morning. I want you to sit and think about that for just a minute. What is the best possible outcome? What is the deepest, most important thing that can, be in, that can happen to you this morning if you have an encounter with God? Is it a feeling? Wow. Is it direction for today? I'd say that's a, probably a little better, but it's still pretty small. Or is it what Paul says? Verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away, and behold, the new things have come. The power to transform your life. To transform your heart, to transform your families, and transform your communities. 
I can be made new and have his power work regularly and daily on me. I'm not perfect. We're not coming in. New creatures is something he's working on in this time. We are new creatures in the sense that in heaven we're already declared such new creatures, but we're working that out in our lives and we need that power of love. That power of love that brought about the resurrection is in this room today in the Holy Spirit saying, I'm not trying to just give you a feeling. I'm here to transform your life. Is that what you want this morning? You may not even feel that deeply. I don't care if you feel it. I want to know if God is saying, I want to do something in your life. Is it a call? Is it to help you deal with sin in your life? Is it to help you come to new conclusions about life? Is it to help you get through some challenges that have been crushing you for decades? What do you need God's love to come in and transform in your life? Do you need him to come and take your wrath out of you? You have to die to the self and pour that wrath into Jesus. Pour it, let God have that wrath. God, if you've been wronged, God's wrath, God was mad for you. God was angry for you that someone sinned against you, that he hurt you. That came out of God's love. But resurrection is the restoration of that. And if you're still holding on to that wrath, if you're still holding on to that anger, you have not let that die in Christ. Let it die. Accept that power of transformative love into your life. Ask him for it this morning. What is this love of God? How deep is his love? Brad put that particular uh, reference, BG's reference into my head, sorry. I'm not here to tell you simply about the intensity of God's love as enormous. True as that is. But God is not like your love, just stronger or more intense. It isn't like we can take the, the concept of love that we have and we walk around with, especially as we, you know, we walk around without Christ or secular. You can't just take God's, your, your concept of love and just ratchet it up to a thousand. God is love. That is a different ball game. He, he isn't love like he might be angry or sorrowful or even patient. His existence is what defines love. His action on the cross isn't an activity or just an event of love. It is the event of love. It is love itself. L again, love is more than a feeling. It is in the, it is into, it's to enter into being. In other words, you have to let it, you have to let love out of just the feeling world and enter into love as the being world. If lo his love didn't exist, we wouldn't exist. That's what I mean by the being world. Without love, there would be no sun. There would be no moon. There would be no joy. There would be no problems because there would be no you. Why? Because without love, he wouldn't have created you knowing that he would have to die for you. There would be nothing if there was not his love, which is his power. The love of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, a community which he begat. He begat human community. He created us as community to join his community. That's why it's so important for the Trinity. People go, why does it matter that there's a Trinity? Because God was not lonely. God was not alone. He created us out of this community and out of this love. And the, the more that we demand that my love for God is just like me, the more I can say, I don't need community. I don't need other people. And we further ourselves from this God-defined, love-creating world. We, cre we separate ourselves from God's love. Love is the very basis of reason. The basis of rationality is the Trinity. And the way they relate is the foundation and even the reconciliation of physics. He creates in a way that brings together things that need to come together and separate that which needs to separate. 
And that's why Paul says, if I'm sounding out of my mind, it's because I'm speaking the language of God. And when I sound logical to you, I'm merely trying to translate into worldly logic. In other words, when you get your love wrong, you get your logic wrong. That's what Paul's saying. I'm talking to you in your language, trying to translate you back to God's language. I'm trying to make this transition. That's why I sound and look so weird, is what Paul is saying. You see, you can't get reality right until you get love right. And you can't get love right until you stare at the cross and you let it go deepest down to every ounce and being of every single cell and atom in your body and you realize it's there because God put it there. God's love compels him to say that there is hope outside their hearts. There is hope outside of legalism, outside of just trying to be an anarchist and bring the system down. Everyone's got their way to try to bring it into happening. He says it's only in love. The only power to save isn't lightning from the sky. He doesn't save us by making a declaration from the throne. He saves us by a death on a cross, the second person of the Trinity, taking our sins, taking our self-centeredness, and dies for all who love him might live. All who surrender that self-love and say, I want that love that's displayed on a cross, they become part of this community of love. And in this love, It ignites new creation. He says new creatures. It ignites new creation. He created, back when I say Genesis, he created out of love. But he creates something infinitely more eternal for us on the cross. Something that just, it's not dust and ashes. It's not death and despair. There is no greater point of love's creation than the cross and the resurrection making us new creatures, promising new hope and new creation when he decides for it. God's love is the only true love, a love given, a love offered to you this morning. What did you come for this morning? A failing? I hope not. I hope it wasn't just that. Did you come for love? Did you come to know God loves you? Because God's love is all over you. He's offering it to flow all through you. To change and transition every aspect of your life. It won't happen like that. Might for some things. But he's making you a new creature. It is the love we glorify when we forgive. I want that in my life. The love to be able to love your enemies. I want that in my life too. The love to sacrifice. The love to say, not my will, Lord, but thine. Let us glorify the love of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit this morning. If you want to respond this morning, I'll be at the front. Be loved to pray with you and ask God's love to come and, and flow into your heart and your mind and your soul to give away that pain and that anger and the fragile world that your heart creates and dip into this eternal world of resurrection.